from Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's ahead. Crop diseases front and center during our first half hour. K-State's Doug Jardine will discuss the rapid spread of southern rust disease in the Kansas corn crop. He'll talk about controlling it with a fungicide application in a timely fashion. Also, the USDA's Bob Bowden talks about efforts to develop more durable resistance to rust disease in winter wheat varieties in collaboration with K-State wheat scientists. And he shares information from a new study of barley yellow dwarf virus and its impact on wheat quality. And on this week's K-State Horticulture segment, Raymond Cloyd looks at the damage being caused by Japanese beetles in home landscapes and what to do about them. Plus more right here on Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network and welcome once more to Agriculture Today. Not all that long back, our first guest today was Mike Seid and talking with us about what at that time was a noticeable lack of disease pressure in Kansas corn. Well, the tide has turned, to put it that way, since we last talked with row crop disease specialist Doug Jardine of K-State Research and Extension, for he's here to report to us today that a prominent corn disease has all of a sudden made its presence known in Kansas corn stands. Doug, we're talking about southern rust, and you say that it's nothing less than an explosion of this disease out there. Well, that's right, Eric. And, you know, it, it's a disease we get every year. And honestly, some years it can be very severe. 2016, uh, 2018, there was quite a bit. 2017, not so much. Um, and a lot of it is, is driven by the weather. This is a disease that likes really hot, humid weather. And, of course, here recently in Kansas, that's exactly uh, what we've been experiencing. Historically with this disease, uh, we would say that it would typically first be visible around the 1st of August, and as long as we had our corn planted on time, which generally meant maybe by May 15th, we would be far enough along in in grain accumulation that we really didn't need to take any action on the disease. And on that occasional year when weather caused delays in the spring and we got the the crop planted later, those would be the years that uh, we would maybe have more significant losses from the disease. But certainly since, uh, oh, I'd say at least 2015, we've noticed a trend of the disease arriving earlier each year. We can contribute that to the general increase in temperatures. So this year, if we trace back from when we found the first finds to when the disease probably actually got here, it probably arrived, the first spores, probably in early June, to be honest. And we talk about kind of how the disease has exploded, if you will. If we go back to the week of uh, July 8, it was only being found in three Gulf Coast states, and that was Louisiana, Mississippi, and Georgia. Midweek that week, so about the 10th of July, we got the first report of southern rust in east-central Arkansas. And then uh, on Thursday that week, we had the first find down just uh, east of Coffeyville in Labette County. And so in the past two weeks, nationally, now it has spread as of today, we have found it in Tennessee, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, of course, Kansas, and just very, very recently, Nebraska. So has it overspread Kansas largely then? So it was reported in Geneva, Nebraska. We've already found it in uh, Sumner, Sedgwick, Harvey, Reno, and Dickinson County. But we can guess that it's basically in every county that US-81 passes through here in Kansas. It's also been, uh, in addition to Lobet, uh, it's also been found in, in Neosho County. 
And so I would say that uh, a large portion of eastern and the central corridor of Canada probably already has rust spores in. It may not have built the levels in the fields where it's easily detected because it can have spotty distribution in the field. So uh, depending on how thoroughly you scout a field, you, you may miss it initially. And so, uh, you know, we're going to encourage people to scout. If they're, they're unsure, they're always welcome to take a photograph uh, and send it to me. It's just jardine at ksu.edu, and we'd be glad to take a look at the photo. And if, if it's a good, sharp photo, we can pretty much tell whether it's southern rust or common rust. Just quickly, Doug, what about western Kansas corn stands? It's been more humid than normal out that way of late. Yeah, if there's some really late planted corn in western Kansas, uh, typically we don't spray for southern rust that far out west uh, because it's arid and it usually doesn't develop early in the season. When it does get there, it's usually getting into September. Uh, but this year we're going to have to probably pay a little bit closer attention to that and, and be ready if necessary. How does one make the distinction between those two rust okay. species? Common rust, as the name implies, is very common in cornfields. We had a lot of common rust early in the season, and I think in our previous interview we talked about that. Um, it was being found mostly on the lower leaves. It likes cooler weather, so we had a fairly cool May and the early part of June, and, and so it kind of got going. But historically, when we've done fungicide trials where common rust was one of the components, we just have never been able to determine that it's causing a yield loss. So we typically don't recommend spraying for common rust. Common rust, if you take a look at it, uh, its pustules are going to be a little bit more lengthy or linear compared to southern rust, which are almost circular. They have a much darker colored rust spore in them, almost a brick red, where uh, with southern rust, it's kind of an orangish brown. And then also with common rust, you'll find pustules on both sides of the leaf. Um, That's very common. With southern rust, they're nearly always on the upper surface. If it gets to be a really severe infection, sometimes you can find some along the midrib on the underside of the leaf, but that's not common. Typically, there won't be any pustules on the underside of the leaf. We do have a publication that helps you to identify, I think it's called something like identifying corn rust diseases in Kansas. I think if they go to the K-State Extension website to the bookstore and just search for rust identification, will pop right up. And we've got some, I think, some pretty good pictures and descriptions that will will help them to identify it. Again, because if it's southern rust, depending on the stage of development of the corn, they're going to want to take some action. And we've all over the map... (laughs) stages of development with this corn crop. So we're going to see quite some variability in this disease threat, aren't we? Absolutely. And as an example, we, I, I received a, a communication from Sumner County, sent some pictures that was clearly southern rust, and they were curious, well, should, should we spray? And my question to them was, so what is your yield potential and what is the stage of development? And the reply was, well, we're at one-third milk line, so the R5 growth stage um, and we have maybe 130 to 150 bushel corn. And I said, well, given that stage of development and the yield potential, it's highly unlikely that it would be profitable to spray. So we go ahead to earlier today and uh, talking to a consultant down in Neosho County, and he has southern rust in the field that hasn't tasseled yet. And so our recommendation would be that as soon as it tassels and silks, you probably want to get a fungicide application out there because he was indicating pretty good yield potential there. We really don't want people spraying in the vegetative stage because what's going to happen is these, depending on which product you use, you're going to get three to four, maybe with a couple of the products, stretch it out to five weeks of protection. So if you spray too early and then as the efficacy of the fungicide starts to wear down, there's a very real possibility that you might have to come in and make a second application. And uh, it's really not cost-effective to apply two fungicides to corn, at least, especially at the current prices. So just like we talk about with gray leaf spot and northern corn leaf blight and some of the other foliar diseases, the, the optimal time is VTR1. Now, having said that, if you're scouting and there's no disease, no southern rust at VTR1, hold off on that spray. And then uh, as soon as you detect it, get out there and spray Because, again, we want to push that efficacious period of the fungicide to cover as much of the grain field period as possible. We know that there's been reports that you can make a very economical spray application, certainly as late as the milk stage, even into soft dough. When you're at soft dough, there's still, you know, almost two-thirds of the dry matter to accumulate at that point. 
But once you start to see those kernels starting to dent up, then it really drops off on on whether it would pay to spray. Now, if you have 300 bushel corn and corn was locked in at 4 or 450, yeah, maybe, but Mm -hmm. for most instances, probably not. Once you get to the, once you start to see the corn dented, you're, you're probably out of that window where it would really make sense to put a spray on. And as far as product efficacy generally, though, we have a, a collection of products out there of fungicides that will get the job done if treated at the right time. Really, yeah, I think part of it is that you have to look at the pre-harvest interval, and if you're if you're making a you know late dose stage application, there's a couple of materials that you're not going to be able to use because of the pre-harvest intervals. Uh, many of the products are common 30-day pre-harvest intervals, so you have to kind of calculate ahead. If I put the fungicide on today, is it going to be a month before I need to harvest? And if the answer is it's going to be at least a month, then you're good. And if you know I've, based on the the maturity of the corn I got and the expected weather conditions, etc., you know, we may be wanting to harvest sooner than that, then you have to look at some other products that may have a 7 or a 14 or 21 day pre-harvest interval. There's a lot of products that do a very good job, uh, maybe even excellent. So there's, there's some generics that do some pretty good jobs with the current corn prices. If producers want to look at some of those generics, that's, that's probably okay. They'll, they'll do a reasonably good job. But the initial task is to positively identify southern rust, distinguish it from common rust. And if, again, any producers have any questions about that ID, they can send you photos directly, contact you otherwise. Yeah. No. And, and just one last quick thing. If the company that they're buying their seed from has Southern Rust ratings, they can check uh, on those. And if you know if it's one that has a, a reasonably good rating, there's nothing that's great out there, I can tell you that, mm-hmm. then maybe you can hold off on the spray depending on how severe it is. But if it's one of those really susceptible ones, then you, you know, you're really going to want to get out there when you find it if you not past at least the soft dose stage. Well, the foliar disease, southern rust, is here in Kansas. Corn stands right now. Producers, be on the alert for it. Doug, thanks. We'll have you back again soon. Hopefully with better news. (laughs) Very good. Doug Jardine, row crop disease specialist, K-State Research and Extension with us. This is Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Agriculture Today is back now, and we've welcomed over Bob Bowden, USDA Research Plant Pathologist, who is stationed at Kansas State University. We've asked Bob to share what he's working on of late in the way of wheat disease issues. That is his forte, and your plate is full. (laughs) Bob, one of the things that has the wheat industry's constant attention, it seems, rust disease and how to contend with it. And that's still a focal point of your efforts, right? You bet. So rust is one of the big things that we work on, and we work really closely with the K-State wheat breeders and the K-State geneticists, but we also work with uh, breeders in other states. We work with Texas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, South Dakota, even up to North Dakota. Some of the things that we try to work with them on is, for example, screening for resistance. So we establish locations where we have a chance to look at resistance to leaf rust in a different location where we'll do stripe rust. For example, we do that at Rossville. And in a different case, we'll do stem rust. We do that here in Manhattan. And the purpose of that is just to screen the upcoming varieties and try to find those that are maybe too weak to really be released, uh, that they're not a good candidate for release, and try to get those out of the system before they even get to farmers' fields. And that's a very important way to make sure that the overall general resistance of our wheat crops is in pretty good shape, is to screen out the weak ones as early as we can in the process. Another thing that we do in our uh, USDA unit here in Manhattan is we do a lot of work with DNA markers. So sometimes it's important to know which particular genes are in the varieties. And so we have a whole lab that's just dedicated to testing the varieties from all the breeders in the region for DNA markers. 
And one of the things that we're also interested in doing is monitoring for changes in the pathogen population. So, for example, you know, we've heard of the, we've talked about the boom and bust cycle where a new variety comes out and it does great for a while. It gets more and more and more popular. And then eventually the pathogen adapts to it mm -hmm. and it loses some of its resistance. And so we want to stay on top of that situation. So I've been working with Eric DeWolf who uh, is a K-State uh, researcher that has been very interested in rust. And so we've been collecting samples. And we're looking forward this fall and this winter to going through those samples and trying to verify whether they really do represent race changes. So let me give you an example. So SY Monument is a very popular variety. I think it might be the most popular variety in Kansas and maybe even in the whole region. Done really, really, really well. It's a great variety. But we did start to see a little bit more leaf rust on it this year. And so the question comes up, is that because we have had a race change in the leaf rust and it's starting to adapt to the, the variety. And so we're going to look at that more closely. So we've collected probably about 50 isolates from different locations, and we'll put those back on Monument and a lot of other varieties and just try to document whether it, if what we think happened is in fact what happened, that it really is a race change. But this is an ongoing cause for you and your fellow researchers to figure out what affects what would be called the durability of resistance to these diseases, not just leaf rust, but the whole rust complex. That's right. And so um, this boom and bust cycle is obviously very destructive to the investments that we've made in, in our varieties, and it's something we'd like to prevent. And so um, we have a couple strategies uh, to try to make things be more durable so that we don't have the boom and bust cycle. And so something that, you know, is released as resistant stays as resistant. And so there's two basic ways that we try to do it. One is combinations of genes. We call them gene pyramids, where we put together three or four or five resistance genes all into the same variety. And then it's much harder for the pathogen to have a mutation to defeat five genes, uh, much more difficult than to defeat one gene. So we're trying to avoid releasing varieties that only have one resistance gene. We're trying to uh, make sure that we release varieties that have as many resistance genes as we can get into there. And the idea there is the resistance genes are protecting each other. So the safest place for a resistance gene is in a variety with other resistance genes. Mm -hmm. they, they protect each other. They say don't put all your eggs in one basket. Actually, you should put all your <laughs> eggs in one basket for resistance <laughs> genes because you don't want to have just one out there by itself because then it's vulnerable. So uh, the gene combination uh, approach is one that's um, – really got a lot of promise and it's, you know, had some good results. And we have some really nice varieties coming down. Well, not varieties. They're pre-varieties. They're candidate varieties coming down the pike now that we've developed in our unit and also with other states where we've got, for example, for stem rust, we've got five different resistance genes stacked into the same variety. They're all good genes and they'll hopefully protect each other. We actually call that gene stewardship. You know, you talk about environmental stewardship. Well, we're starting to think about our resistance genes as a resource, something that costs us a lot of money to go get in the first place. Yeah. You know, we go and do a lot of research to find these resistance genes. We find them in wild relatives. We spend years moving them to a new variety. What we don't want to do is put them out there and have them be defeated in three years. So we have to think about not so much – protecting the wheat variety as we need to think about protecting the genes in the wheat variety. It's kind of a new way to think about it. And as I said, we did see possibly some changes in the leaf rust population that we need to track that down and see if that's really true. We also thought we saw some changes in the striped rust population. Again, it was SY Monument and maybe LCS Chrome and maybe uh, WB Grainfield. We think we might have seen some changes on that, but we need to track that down by doing some work uh, this fall and this winter. So one of the reasons that we want to keep track of these new races is to get better ratings for the, for the producers so that we can tell them more accurately how we think things are going to perform next year. But another thing we do with those new isolates is we can use them in our screening program. So we're trying to stay one step ahead or two step. I'd like to be three steps ahead <laughs> of the pathogen, but at least one step ahead. So those new races that have new variants are actually very, very useful for us to use in our screening program. So we'll use that new one to screen our up-and-coming varieties. And so if they're resistant to the new one, that's much better than if they were only resistant to the old races that we had. So there's a reason for us to make sure we have a good, up-to-date collection of these isolates of, of rust. 
Now, we want to mention something else that you've been working on. Actually, a new study and a write-up on it has been released. And this, not on rust, but on barley yellow dwarf and its impact on our wheat stands in Kansas? Yeah, so barley yellow dwarf is that disease that causes the tips of the leaves to turn yellow, and it's uh, very, very common in Kansas. It's probably our most common virus disease in Kansas. It's very serious, especially, I would say, in the eastern half of the state. It's carried by aphids, and we haven't had a lot of resistance to barley yellow dwarf. We've had a little bit of tolerance, but it really has been something we've been having a hard time dealing with. One of the ways to deal with it would be with uh, planting date. If you plant a little bit later, you can avoid some of those flights of aphids. Another way is to um, use seed treatments. Uh, some of the insecticides are good ag- against aphids. And Bill Bacchus, who was a researcher here at K-State for many, many years, very, very famous plant pathologist, worked on barley odorf and studied the effect of those management practices. Well, luckily, he collected the seed from all those studies over all those years. So we had all those grain samples that were uh, in storage. And so we worked with some people from USDA to try to look at the impact of barley yellow dwarf on the quality of those samples. So we could have had a nice comparison where Bill would have had an untreated control, and then right next to it, he had a, one that he gave the the ultimate control where he sprayed it like eight times <laughs> with insecticide, starting in the fall all the way to wow. spring. So it had like no barley yellow dwarf. Also put a seed treatment on it. So it's like it was clean. So that side-by-side comparison allowed us to go in and say, okay, what does the virus do to the quality of the grain in terms of the test weight and in terms of the kernel size and in terms of the protein and the starch? And what we found was really big effect on protein and starch. So barley yellow dwarf shrivels the grain. So not surprisingly, the amount of starch content goes down. But a little bit surprisingly, when you first think about it, the protein goes up. But it's really not that surprising because we know that a lot of stresses on wheat will cause the grain to shrivel and the protein actually goes up under stress. So barley yellow dwarf does that. And so we found when we looked at different varieties that they didn't all act the same, that some had a really big gain in protein and loss in starch and others had very little. And so what we're thinking, and we'll give me, I'll give you an example of two that didn't have a very big effect. Canmark and Armour were two varieties that didn't seem to have a very big effect. And so what we think we've kind of backed ourselves into and discovered is tolerance. So it's got the disease, but it tolerates the disease. So it doesn't shrivel the grain as much, and it doesn't change the, the yield or the, the, the uh, test weight as much. And so what we think is that this method, using samples that either have barley yellow dwarf or don't have barley yellow dwarf, and then you take them to the lab and you run them through the near-infrared analyzers, which can tell you how much protein you've got and how much starch you've got, can give us an objective way to finally uh, say which varieties actually have tolerance to this disease. And you can't tell by looking at them. You can have one that like looks green, but it still has a big impact on the yield. And you can have one that looks yellow, and it doesn't have as much So you can't really rely on symptoms. And so we think we finally found a way to have a much more objective way to breed for much better tolerance to barley yellow dwarf and get away from some of this impact. That that was the point. You can take that information, identifying those differences, and then uh, uh, dial it back, if you will, into the uh, genetic selection process. Yes. This could very easily be put into the selection program. We could maybe finally identify the genes. Well, what are the genes that give you tolerance to this? And then we could, then we could test for those genes, you know, uh, in our, uh, in our DNA marker lab. So uh, there's a lot of bright outcomes that could come from this research. So really, Bob, you have a lot of things on the boiler right now. And the uplifting thing is that the, your work and that of your colleagues is bearing good results on these matters. Yeah, it's been a great collaboration with K-State. We've got a lot of good things in the oven. Excellent. Well, it's always good to visit with you and get caught up on the achievements in this area of wheat disease management and resistance. And thanks, Bob, for coming over. Thank you, Eric. Bob Bowden with us, USDA research plant pathologist. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. More shortly for you on this, the K-State Radio Network. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Now, 
now in our 95th year of broadcast service to Kansas agriculture. This is Agriculture Today on the K-State Radio Network. Welcome back. Eric Atkinson here to today's agricultural news headlines now, courtesy in part of DTN. A U.S. Senate committee unanimously advanced a bill yesterday to tighten security around agricultural products coming into U.S. ports. The Protecting America's Food and Agriculture Act of 2019 would address the shortage of agricultural inspectors at ports examining imported food and agricultural products. Senators stated the bill would authorize the U.S. Customs and Border Protection to hire more inspectors for airports, seaports, and land ports of entry. This legislation would allow the CBP to hire 240 more inspectors annually who would specialize in agriculture, as well as 200 technicians to support those inspectors. Now, this bipartisan bill advanced out of the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee after being introduced by Senator Gary Peters of Michigan, the ranking member of the committee, along with Senator Pat Roberts of Kansas, who's the chairman of the Senate Agriculture Committee, and his ranking member, Senator Debbie Stabenow of Michigan. This legislation comes as the pork industry seeks to ward off the risks of African swine fever entering the U.S. Back in March, the CBP agents seized around 1 million pounds of Chinese pork that had been shipped in more than 50 containers into Newark, New Jersey. CBP needed more than 100 agricultural specialists and search dogs to uncover the pork, which had been smuggled with boxes of ramen noodles and detergent. While there's been no evidence the pork seized in March was contaminated with swine fever, the case still reflects the potential risks and the scale of illegal agricultural smuggling into the U.S. This bill has the support of a broad array of business groups, including the National Pork Producers Council, the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, the American Farm Bureau Federation, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. The U.S. continues to actively pursue a trade agreement with Japan, and agriculture may well come up first in those negotiations. Here's more from the USDA's Gary Crawford. The upper house elections in Japan are done now. And uh, they've committed to get coming to the table over uh, trade discussions as soon as that's over, and we're going to hold them to that. Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue at a meeting of ag lenders in Washington this week, and he told reporters afterwards. They know what we are looking for and what we're expecting. I sort of outlined that. It's been very clear. It's been very reasonable about our expectations from Japan. Japan, by far, the United States is your best customer, and we want to be treated as one of your better customers. Now, there are many trade issues with Japan covering many products and economic sectors, but Purdue says... There have been signals that they are willing to do uh, uh, an ag-first policy on trade and then look at the uh, tougher issues later on, you know, going forward. And he said he's very optimistic the U.S. and Japan will reach an ag agreement that will benefit both nations. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. And enrollment in the new USDA Dairy Margin Coverage Program has already exceeded one-third of the licensed U.S. dairy operations. That's according to the department's first weekly update on signups for the new program. Of the nation's 37,000 licensed dairy operations, over 13,000 had enrolled in the program as of last Monday. Among the states, Wisconsin led enrollments with 4,000 farms, followed by Minnesota with 15 New York with 1,400, and Pennsylvania with 1,100 farms. So far, those farms enrolled in the program have qualified for $145 million in payments, $41 million of that going to Wisconsin operations alone. The DMC was established under the 2018 Farm Bill. Dairy groups have encouraged farmers to enroll in the program, stressing the major improvements under this program compared with its predecessor, the Margin Protection Program. Lawmakers crafted the new program with help from dairy groups to avoid many of the shortcomings of the MPP, which saw poor enrollment and never lived up to expectations. Farms that enrolled in the MPP between 2014 and 2017 are eligible for a partial refund of premiums that they paid into it, up to 50% for cash refunds or 75% if applied toward the DMC premiums. 
You're listening to Agriculture Today and now our regular Thursday feature, the Kansas Soybean Update, and awaiting with it, as always, is Greg Akagi. Greg? Todd Vogelsinger, Director of Marketing with Columbia Forest Products, joins us. And Todd, U.S. soybean growers and your company achieved a major milestone celebrating the use of U.S. soy inside 100 million panels of Columbia Forest Products Pure Bond Plywood. We're the nation's leading producer of decorative hardwood plywood, which is what you might find in your kitchen cabinetry or furniture, maybe even your wall paneling. It's usually wood-based layered material like plywood, except with a decorative face like cherry or hickory or oak. The bonding agent that used to be used in this category was a formaldehyde glue. In the early 2000s, we began to explore options to that. How could we get out of formaldehyde in our product And we came upon a terrific solution that is really based on 95% soy flour. The relationship between Columbia Forest Products and the United Soybean Board, this has been a long-standing one. I think early in in the process, when it was acknowledged that we were using soy flour as our solution, the Soy Board came along and was extremely interested to support many different ways our commercialization of this technology. And lo and behold, 100 million panels later, we're still collaborating to extend the use of soy as an industrial bonding agent in our products and uh, across the industry. And if you're using soy flour, if you made 100 million panels plus now, that's a lot of soy flour to produce. You do the math and it comes down to basically 6.8 million bushels of soybeans that went into this. And we produced enough plywood to go around the earth six plus times. And in four by eight sheets, that's a lot of wood, a lot of soybeans. Now, is pure bond plywood cost competitive in the market? It sure is. When we converted to the uh, soy-based formulation, we did not raise the price. Since then, we've actually grown our market share. We are the dominant plywood producer in the decorative segment in North America. We're pleased to have been able to produce this product and uh, to share its benefit at no added cost to the consumer. That is Todd Vogelsinger, Director of Marketing with Columbia Forest Products, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Greg Akagi there. Thanks, Greg. We'd invite you to join the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of folks who have taken advantage of our podcast service to subscribe to that and find out more about it. AgToday.net is your informational source, agtoday.net. This is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Coming your way now on this Agriculture Today, our weekly K-State horticulture segment and another assortment of insects in our lawn and garden settings are after it, and we want to bring those to your attention and advise what to do about those with Raymond Cloyd aboard once again, horticultural entomologist with K-State Research and Extension. As noted as we parted last time, Raymond, there will be no lack of insect activity now that we're into the true heart of summer. One of the things you'll bring to our attention today, the green June beetle is readily found out there now. Yeah, the green June beetle uh, is flying around in droves. And one of the issues, it kind of is always mistaken for Japanese beetles, but they're very different. In fact, our next newsletter article will have um, uh, basic information about the green June beetle and an image of Japanese beetles. The Japanese beetles, which we'll talk about, uh, have these white tufts of hairs in the back of their abdomen, where green June beetles are are dull metallic green. Um, They look like they're flying around like tanks because they're so big. They're not really going to cause much damage, although we can see them feed on fruit 
apples or something like that if it's been damaged, some corn tassels. But in terms of damage compared to the Japanese beetle, there is no comparison. The green June beetle feeds on organic matter, the larvae in the ground. So they're just more of a nuisance or anomaly out there flying around in droves and running into your buildings. And and they can be entertaining, yeah. And more of an annoyance, maybe, if anything else. We have seen some, in western Kansas, uh, information about this, thousands of these things, whatever that means, just flying around. And again, and again it's just an anomaly. Anomaly. They'll eventually stop, and then and then it's all over. So they're not much more than a curiosity out there. You mentioned, though, the Japanese beetles, and we have been talking about those. Those are quite abundant as well, and they do inflict damage, right? Absolutely, Eric. Uh, the Japanese beetle feeds in over 350 plant species, primarily in the rose family. Uh, roses, pears, cherries, plums, crab apples would be one. Uh, and that one you have to do something about. Uh, the adults are out for several months, and they'll cause extensive damage, so you have to spray with an insecticide. And then later on, they'll, uh, the females will lay eggs in the soil. The eggs then hatch, and these larvae then feed on the turf grass. And they're a problem in August, September, because that's when it's hot and dry, and it typically the turf grass is stressed. But right now, they're out there feeding on the above-ground portions, and people have to do something, or they're going to they're gonna suffer some pretty destructive damage on the roses. And uh, once more, distinguishing them from the green June beetle, the uh, Japanese beetle a bit different. Different in appearance? Yeah, the Japanese beetle is smaller, for one. They're, they're coppery colored, the wings, um, more metallic green than the green June beetle. Right. But the really, the major morphological distinguishing characteristic is those tufts of white hair on the back of the abdomen of the Japanese beetle, which are absolutely are not present at all on the green June beetle. Right. Yeah. As far as contending with Japanese beetles, standard insecticides will get the job done? Yeah, unfortunately, the insecticides we have are pretty harmful to beneficials and even bees. So really, if you're going to spray, don't spray when bees are active. And if you spray too often, what could happen, you can stimulate spider mite outbreaks because you're killing on the natural predators that are out there. So really be cautious. However, we just don't have an alternative. This is an insect that's been around in 1916 and there's been lots of papers, but we're still relying on our standard contact broad spectrum materials. Uh, we don't recommend the the Japanese beetle traps because you'll allure a lot more. At least at least if you put them near your yard, we do recommend them as Christmas presents to your neighbors and let them deal with it. <laughs> but uh, there we really uh, don't recommend them because of the fact they'll they lure Japanese beetles in for miles, and and the Japanese beetles can actually feed before they get into the traps. So you can actually increase damage as a possibility. So homeowners, gardeners, be vigilant against Japanese beetles for a few weeks yet. They'll be around. Yeah, and if you have small uh, numbers, you can easily disturb them and hit them over some soapy water, and it kills them. I mean, they're very lethargic in the morning, and just shake the branches. The legs will flare out, and you can put some soapy water, and it'll drop right down into it. Now, if you've got thousands of Japanese beetles, th- then that's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> they're active, though. That's <laughs> the point. And be alert to Japanese beetle feeding on a variety of landscape plants, vegetable crops out there right now. Walnut caterpillars, these are now evident, and they can defoliate walnuts in a seeming heartbeat. <laughs> well, you have experience with that, don't you? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've gotten some calls uh, of uh, uh, biblical proportions of walnut caterpillars, and in and, and these large trees, it's hard to get them. We, I do recommend you talk to an arborist that is uh, trained in spraying, and too, you can spray them because they're moving up the tree pretty easy. But if you don't get at them, and they're large numbers, they will defoliate, basically leave no leaves on a walnut tree. Now, what do these look like so folks can make sure? Well, the early instar stages are reddish, uh, and then they become black later on, and they're, they're covered with hairs, too. And when you see them on the bark, they, they're kind of aggregating, and they have They're this, in hordes, aren't they? Hordes, basically. yeah. And then, then there's this, this filmy, cottony material around them, and then, of course, as they get bigger, they start, they start migrating away from that. They, they become less... They don't aggregate as much, and they become more solitary, um, but they still can cause substantial damage, especially on smaller walnut trees. Now, if they're feeding, will that damage uh, set it back? Well, Large trees will survive, and they'll come back the next year. But if you're looking for shade from a walnut and there's no leaves, that can become a problem. But no real permanent setback for those more mature walnut trees. For the more mature walnut trees, probably not. But younger ones, maybe so it might set them back. Or or maybe they could be susceptible to a wood-boring insect or something else because they're basically stressed from the feeding. The leaves are being removed, so there's no manufacturing of food via photosynthesis. So it could stress them out a little bit. And... uh, 
very few beneficial enemies of walnut caterpillars? There are, but they just don't kill enough of them to impact the populations, yeah. So one will have to likely treat. Right, and the, the same materials for bagworms probably could be used on the walnut caterpillar. All right. And a quick update on squash bugs in our vegetable gardens, and they're still getting after it as well? Yeah, the eggs are being laid, and uh, actually I was out last week. We found some uh, early instar nymphs on squash, so they've hatched. So, And that's a susceptible life stage, and that's where you want to use like a 1% oil or some contact material, but you get to get in the leaf undersides because that's where they're at. You can squish the eggs if you want to, but, you know, they're going to become a problem later on as adults, especially as pumpkins mature and some of the other cucurbits start maturing. So they're out and about, and you need to do something, or you're just going to have these hordes of uh, squash bugs all over the place. And, again, they are more oriented toward the cucurbit crops, the melons and the like. Yeah, watermelon is not a favorite source there, but squash, cucumber, zucchini, things like that are, are, no, and are known to be, and pumpkins are known to be fed, fed upon by squash bug. We'll welcome you back soon. Thanks, Raymond, for the time. Always enjoy it, Eric. Look forward to our next visit. He keeps us up to date on insect activity in lawn and garden. Raymond Cloyd, horticultural entomologist, K-State Research and Extension. And that closes out our Thursday edition. Thanks for tuning in, and please rejoin us right here tomorrow, won't you? Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.